patterns uh, start of the new academic year and the start of our distinguished address series which uh, this evening is in a virtual world so i hope that you are all sitting comfortably and that your connections are solid uh, and of course that you are socially distanced um, uh, and you haven't had any difficulties uh, obviously getting onto the university campus and parking so uh, this is a new venture for us and a new venture for uh, you and I hope that you really enjoy it and engage uh, as you always do uh, with these great uh, sessions. Um, uh, I'm joined this evening uh, by some colleagues who are going to be discussing uh, the topic of responding to a national crisis, building the NHS Nightingale Hospital uh, and we'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a few moments but I would just like to start by uh, saying of course the genesis of all of these um, discussions really stem back to Dr. Bolland, who was the first director of the Polytechnic, who was very clear that one of the roles of the Polytechnic and now the university uh, is about reaching out and working in partnership uh, with industry sectors, public sector, uh, and making a difference to the communities that we all work in. Uh, and I think this evening is a great example of how a university works effectively to deliver on that particular agenda. I'm delighted to say that his son um, is going to be joining us, uh, Geoffrey Bolland, um, and he's joining us from Australia. So I hope that the connections hold out for him uh, and a very warm welcome to uh, Geoffrey uh, this evening. Uh, you're very welcome. And of course, you're all welcome uh, again uh, to the university. And uh, no matter how long uh, COVID is with us for, we will continue to engage with you uh, even in this new uh, virtual world that we're having to navigate. The format for this evening is very similar to the ones that we've always done, except that you won't get the usual briefing on the fire alarm. So if anything is ringing in your ears, it definitely is tinnitus or definitely your house uh, or your environment that is the problem and not the universities. Um, we are going to be having a similar format in terms of um, uh, discussion and then Q&As and you can uh, put in your questions and we'll try and accommodate those as we go through uh, the event. Um, and of course, if there are technical glitches on the way, please bear with us, please stay with us um, uh, and we'll make sure that we get through any technical issues that might arise. I'm uh, fingers crossed and I hope your fingers are crossed as well. Um, I'm going to start this evening by uh, introducing um, one of our partners, uh, John Brown, president of ICAEW, uh, to say a few words. Um, John's going to just mention his involvement and then I'm going to take us into uh, the main body uh, of this evening's event. So I hope you enjoy it and have fun. Thanks, Steve. So good, good evening, everyone. My name is John Brown. And I, as Steve said, I'm the president of the West of England Society of Chartered Accountants, who are a key partner to the Bristol Distinguished Address Series. Uh, in my day job, I work at KPMG and I head up our work for the NHS across the south. So um, I've seen firsthand the incredible way uh, the NHS and others have gripped the Nightingale Challenge. And so I'm really delighted to introduce our panel this evening. Um, the Nightingale Hospital in Bristol was an incredible effort, 300 bed hospital, 20 days, and it was testament to the dedication, the hard work, the teamwork from key contributors that are represented here tonight. Whether that's UE Bristol staff, the Army, the NHS, the contractors here, but hundreds and hundreds of people that have made sacrifice to make it happen. And it's not just a building, um, the operational governance, the IT, um, the risk management. Um, now, in my role as introducer, I would normally go through uh, the speakers, tell you a little bit about the careers and the highlights, but who we've got uh, for you tonight, uh, that would take me all evening. So without further ado, let me introduce the panel. We'll obviously ha hear from Steve West, Vice-Chancellor of UWE, the landlord, if you like, uh, Marino Elzel, the Chief Officer of the Nightingale Hospital Bristol, Tim Whittleston, the Chief Medical Officer, and also David now the operations uh, director. So I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion. And without further ado, I'll hand back to Steve. Thank you, uh, 
John, and I'm going to start just by setting the scene uh, for you all. And and uh, as I do that, I'll also be um, uh, looking to my colleagues to to follow and just describe their story uh, and their involvement in this uh, fantastic venture uh, that's been created over the past uh, few months. Um, I'm going to go back to the 25th of March. And on the 25th of March, I got a telephone call um, from a regional team who were saying, um, we would quite like to visit your campus uh, and see uh, whether or not uh, your campus would be one that could be used as part of a national effort. And at that point, I really didn't know very much about what they were talking about until uh, they said uh, a Nightingale uh, Field Hospital. So the 25th of March was the telephone call. On the 26th of March, the army arrived uh, with surveyors and some colleagues from the NHS at regional level. And they uh, arrived uh, at our exhibition center first thing in the morning and uh, did a very, very, very fast recce. It was amazing to watch these uh, army personnel jump out of their trucks and like ants just crawl all over uh, the facility uh, and then regroup after about an hour, regroup uh, and give their view as to whether or not this was a possibility. Uh, and the news was that it was a possibility. It was one of uh, several that they were looking at on that particular day uh, and that they thought, yes, it was possible that this could be a uh, Nightingale Field Hospital. So that was on the 26th of March. And on the 27th of March, then things really kicked off. Uh, we started to see colleagues arriving from the NHS and colleagues from Kia and uh, architects arriving to start to think through how on earth we're going to convert what was a tired looking exhibition centre at the university. Um, I, I hadn't really been used effectively by the university. It was for exam space and a variety of other things, uh, a few conferences. Um, but actually, how could you transform that into something that would add value uh, immediately to the community? And then the work began. And I'm not going to say any more about that because colleagues will start to pick that story up at that point. I have to say that as the vice chancellor of the university, the chief executive, um, I was required to make the decision um, as to whether or not we would hand over the exhibition centre for this purpose. And that was probably one of the easiest decisions I've ever made. Uh, very quickly, uh, I turned and said, yes, of course, we'll do whatever we need to do as a university to support uh, our local communities um, and also the NHS. And of course, my background in part is the NHS. And once you have been part of the NHS, it never leaves you. So I'm delighted that we've been able to support and contribute. Uh, and I speak on behalf of the entire board and all of the staff of the university in saying how proud we are of what has been created. And of course, we set sail hoping that it would never, ever have to be used. Uh, because all of us hoped that we would be in a position whereby we would have controlled the virus. We would all done our bit. We would all kept social distance. We would have followed the guidelines. We would have ensured that we made sure that our hygiene and our approach was protecting us and others. And so from those early days, the point was, yes, we might need a facility, but we'll only need it if we don't succeed in other ways. So that's really the starting place of this great story. And this evening, we're going to hear from colleagues who contributed, led uh, and drove the agenda uh, over a very short period of time. I'm joined this evening uh, by uh, colleagues from the NHS uh, and from uh, Kia as Construction. And I want to start just by uh, introducing a film uh, that we're going to show. And then that sets the scene, I think, in terms of the story, the creation, and then the hard work will begin around what next. Uh, I'm joined this evening by um, David Snell, by uh, Marie, uh, Noelle Orzel, who's better known as Noz, and Tim Whittlestone. And all of them have been fantastic leaders over this journey. Uh, Noz as the NHS Nightingale Hospital Chief Executive, Tim as the Chief Medical Officer, 
uh, of the Nightingale Hospital and David Snell as the operations director of Kia. And it was a fantastic team effort. So without further ado, let's look at what was created over that very short period of time back in March and April. So here we are on the last day at the Nightingale Hospital Bristol. We've done it, we've finished it on time, uh, an amazing feat. In my entire career at Kia, which I accept is quite long now, I have never ever seen anything quite as brilliant as this. There's been roughly 20 to 23 staff here for nearly three weeks now, and we've achieved everything the clients set us. We've seen the most amazing combined force, the energy of a wonderful bunch of people who've managed to work together to create what we've done in a remarkably short period of time. Huge amount of change, massive variations. With three days to go, we had an instruction to add in suction pipe work, two and a half kilometers of additional copper pipe, which was done, procured, installed, all on time. The oxygen tanks are on test, and assuming they achieve their 10 bar for two hours, then we have got the final piece of paper, which achieves handover. First day we walked onto site, we saw this as a, a conference centre that was used by university students and we were asked to convert it into an intensive care unit, maximising the number of beds to get on site in an absolutely ridiculous timescale. I just didn't think that we could do it. But then I met the Kia team who convinced me that we were going to bring the A team to site. And I think within a matter of hours, I had the confidence, do you know what? I think we might be able to pull this off. We've had around 10 Kia managers from Devon, from Wales and from our Bristol office. Um, a lot of us haven't worked together before. We've all uh, gelled in a manner that I've, I've never seen on a project before. We're all in one room, uh, coordinating on a daily basis, um, and we've all pulled together so quickly here. It's, it, it's an absolute credit to everyone that's been involved. With everyone being in lockdown, you feel quite separate from the whole process that's going on. Being able to be here and do something that's helping um, has really been really great. And I think everybody's really been, had a huge positive attitude. Working here, everyone's got a smile on their face, everybody just wants to make it happen. Um, and it's been hugely rewarding, yeah, so really, really pleased. Uh, 16 days to deliver a scheme of this size and magnitude is, a, is of course a huge challenge, but we really have managed to achieve a good standard, um, a, a good level of quality and finish. Um, and again, all of the subbies are bought into that and, and we're making sure that we're not letting our standards drop. I um, had two weeks in isolation due to my flatmate showing symptoms and was supposed to be on holiday for this week but as I'd already had two weeks off I kind of insisted I came here. I wanted to be back on site and I wanted to be doing some work. So these tanks will supply the hospital with all the oxygen that the patients need and hopefully help save lots of lives. I can go home and, and say to my wife every day that I've, I've made a difference to the health of others um, going forward and um, it's been a, a big privilege for me to, to work with the team. Kia staff have been superb. Every single one has performed beyond what we would expect. 12 hour shifts, seven days a week. Really, really good. Our supply chain, particularly Integral and Pretty on the ME side, have done a superb job. 50 to 60 engineers here for most of the period, still 20 or so doing commissioning now. None of us want to come back here in seven to 10 days time when the patients start arriving. It will be a quite different environment from that which we've seen over the last 17 days ourselves. The NHS team that we've worked with on those 17 days to get here have been superb and the care that they're going to provide I'm sure will be second to none. I've walked around with the client today and to say that they are overjoyed what they see is an understatement. It is a wonderful building and I think everyone in Kia should be proud of what we've achieved. So what a fantastic film, but uh, a huge amount of work that went into creating a facility that then needed to transform and be translated into a facility uh, that would be able to accommodate patients. And I have to say, every time I see uh, that video, 
uh, the emotions of that period flood back. And I am so incredibly proud of everybody who worked on that project. Um, all of my colleagues at the university, but, but also all of the trades and all of the people who were supporting a huge amount of work. Uh, it does bring a lump to your throat, I have to say. And no matter how many times I see it, it just reminds me of the emotional commitment that was there, as well as the technical expertise to solve problems. So I'm going to pass uh, to David, really, to tell his story and share a few of his insights uh, by way of supporting what you've just seen. And of course, David was uh, the narrator of that particular film. Hello there. Yeah, so thank you, Steve. It was, um, you obviously saw me uh, on the video saying my piece uh, earlier. Um, it's difficult to expand on it because I think the, the video told the story. Um, my role, I'm operations director for Kia Construction based in Bristol. Um, so I ordinarily would be overseeing multiple projects, uh, quite a lot of health schemes. We're working at RUH Bath, as we have been for many years, uh, Musgrove Park Hospital, where we've got a very large scheme on site now, um, and uh, NHS Transfusion Service in Bristol as well. So health has always um, formed a very large proportion of, of what we do. But we don't just do that. We build office blocks, hotels and schools and university buildings as well. So. Um, Putting together a team, uh, it's interesting to hear Steve's countdown to the to the event, and it's um, it's so close to, to my recollection that uh, so Steve heard about it on the 25th. Um, I first heard about the project on the late afternoon, early evening on the 26th. Was given a challenge of um, by NHS EI of pulling a team together and presenting to them late, later that evening my thoughts on how I would um, undertake the project if Keir were uh, able to secure it. So um, I was given about an hour to go away, um, select a design team, select the principal contractors to work alongside us, particularly the M&E, um, and go back with a effectively a, a presentation on why Keir. Um, I did that that evening, and later that night was told, um, congratulations, you've been successful, um, and met Steve. Uh, the our design team were there and um, met various other members of the university staff there eight o'clock on Friday the 27th. Um, we didn't actually get the go ahead to spend any money um, until the 1st of April, which was the following Wednesday. Uh, so the, the project was built between uh, the 1st of April and the 20th of April. Um, we used the, the time between uh, arriving there on Friday the 27th and commencing on the 1st of April to effectively design it. Um, we, we had on the 28th, 9th um, of, of March, we had um, over 100 people working on the scheme. We were surveying the building, understanding what we were taking on, trying to get to grips with existing services, making sure we understood how uh, we were going to facilitate the building. Through that, those first few days in the run up to the 1st of April, which is when we got the, uh, the go ahead to spend some money and, and take on other contractors, um, we saw the university really stepping up to the mark. They knew that the challenge was immense um, and I, we were um, amazed at the support that we'd had from, from the university. They supplied us with teas and coffees, they brought in printers and plotters, they knew what we needed. Um, and they had the facilities elsewhere on the campus, which obviously uh, due to the, the um, lockdown weren't being utilised. So, the university security team made sure that we had whatever we could get in the first few days. We established a site office in the middle of the building. There was no time to build any um, site accommodation. Um, so we, we were working effectively within the building that we were refurbishing and altering through the whole of the period. And as you've seen on the video, um, it just turned into a fantastic experience. In the 20 days, we inducted over 600 people um, to work on the scheme. Uh, we didn't want to work. 24-7. I've, I've tried that in the past and it's not a very good way of working. So I identified that I wanted the scheme to work or the project to work um, from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. seven days a week, which is what we did. Um, it's a large enough building to ensure social distancing for all the individuals working there. Um, so keeping it to the 12 hours and ensuring that we had one team delivering it throughout was, um, in my opinion, the, the right way of doing it. The journey from 
first of April when we were ripping up carpets and, and re, uh, removing the raised access flooring to install drainage and uh, fire compartmentation beneath it, right the way through to the final cleaning on the evening of the the uh, the evening of the 19th of, of April to allow us to hand over the 20th um, was a, a whirlwind. The supply chain couldn't have been more helpful we didn't have one issue which we had to deal with that was anything other than people trying to put too many staff and too many people on the scheme uh, and more than we actually needed um we had support from all suppliers clearly mentioning the nightingale hospital in any correspondence or conversations ensured at that time that we got uh, a high level of commitment and, and it couldn't have been easier to marshal the troops that we um that we mustered so I think the video said it all. I don't want to talk for too long, um, but it, a great experience for us. And, and obviously we'll pick up any questions uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, that's really great. Uh, um, and I'm going to take the story on uh, now and look at it through the eyes of um, uh, the chief executive that was responsible for pulling this together from a uh, the environment that was to create something that would work as a hospital that would satisfy all of the requirements in terms of health and safety um, and quality of, of uh, care delivery so Noz can you tell us a little bit about your story and your first uh, impressions thank you Steve um, yes and uh, thank you uh, for showing the video again like you it it makes my heart swell um, with pride looking at what everyone achieved in um, delivering the Nightingale. Might be helpful just to give a bit of my background. Um, I'm a nurse by background um, and predominantly in acute care, um, but I have been um, an executive nurse for quite a few years and a chief exec and worked nationally. But actually at the time of um, the start of the COVID, I was working um, independently as well as a non-exec director and working part time. Like many others, as the COVID um, crisis evolved, I did think about what can I do? What can I do to offer my experience and my services uh, back to the NHS? So uh, to follow the timeline on Sunday, the 29th of March, uh, because I had the contacts, I wrote to uh, regional NHS colleagues and national NHS colleagues and said, um, look, I can make myself available for full time work. Is there anything that I can do? And if I'm absolutely honest, I was expecting to go and do some back to nursing type uh, training and I was going to be quite happy supporting a busy ED department. I sent that email at uh, 10 o'clock and I got a response at 10 past 10 um, asking if I would consider the um, Nightingale. If I'm honest, my, uh, my reference point for Nightingales at that point was really what we'd all seen and heard um, about the Excel Nightingale in London. Um, so 29th, uh, I started then on the 30th of March. And I think it's important to say uh, very quickly um, what we did. We were a tiny team at that point. I hadn't met UWE colleagues. I'd not been um, on the camp on the campuses yet. But very quickly, we established um, a very simple mission, and that was to save lives, to provide hope. But most importantly, what we were looking at was to develop a facility that would provide resilience to the other hospitals trusts throughout um, wider than Bristol, but throughout what we call the seven network, Yeovil to Gloucester. So my reflection, and I've really thought about this, I actually finished with the Nightingale uh, in July, but my reflection on this is what, what is it that made this unique? What I should say, and I think Steve's already alluded to it, I've got a bit of a split personality career wise. Um, I do have military experience. I'm still an active reservist and hence I've got the nickname Noz um, and had it for years. So and I have been out on deployments um, in Iraq and in the Balkans. And yet 
delivering the nightingale was a particularly unique experience for me and there are a number of issues that made that unique when i started on the 30th and tim might correct me if i'm wrong i think there were only three of us identified maybe four as the leadership team so we started with a very incomplete team we rapidly over the next two weeks built up that leadership team but we had to hit the ground running. The other thing that made this project really unique, and you'll have seen some of that through the video, was um, a quite enormous level of partnership working. And that was at a number of different levels. So there was the partnership working, and I think David's already said it, Yui could not have been more accommodating to us right at those early days and the tea and coffee was very, very important. But we worked with a number of other partners who we'd never met before. Clearly there was Kia who were already um, up and running. But within two days we had the army arrive on our doorstep. We weren't really told why, but we had them there. We worked with um, a director of ops who came from the events industry and knowing we needed some rapid help, he brought in uh, our security, he found us a burger van so we had food, so we worked in partnership with the events industry. But importantly, if you take it from an NHS perspective, I've done quite a range of leadership roles, but never before have I joined a leadership team where the leaders were selected from a variety of NHS organisations. None of us had ever met before. And that went down to the next level. We purposefully chose um, execs and senior leaders to represent the hospital trust from across the seven network. So everyone could have their input and we got that ownership of what the Nightingale facility would offer. And then finally, what I think was very different about the Nightingale uh, is, and it sounds a very simple word, but the pace. I've been involved in capital programmes, looking at building new departments, new hospitals, whether it's a women's hospital. Um, I was involved in uh, the capital programme to build the Brunel building at Southmead. Now, if anyone's worked in the NHS with these projects, you usually monitor progress uh, using months and years. We didn't have that luxury and what we had to do and what we did do, we monitored the progress. I think we could say in hours, but definitely days. I couldn't, I couldn't finish my part without saying how unique the people were. They were selected um, through probably word of mouth because of their experience, but somehow we got people, and again, the same as our Keir colleagues, who without asking went more than the extra mile. I'm not sure there's a phrase to describe it. We, we um, a couple of examples I'd really like to talk about was Hayley Hughes, I'll name her. We had people who said, this isn't just a field hospital, we want to offer the best and the most compassionate care. And they did, and they encouraged us as exec leaders to support them and put the processes in place. Whilst Keir were doing all the construction work, we in the background had to do all the operational management work, we had to develop all the clinical protocols, we had to develop the infrastructures and the governance systems to ensure that we'd managed all the risks and we'd um, offer high quality and safe care. And the fact that we, I used 23 days, we had to go past the 20 days and get um, all our assurance signed off. The fact that we achieved that in 23 days was quite remarkable. And it was down to all those people working collaboratively. And um, as Steve said, I still remain incredibly proud to have been part of this experience. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Noz. Um, and um, we'll carry on the story with some questions and answers. And if any of you, um, uh, after we've done the, the panel discussion, want to pose any questions, then please use um, slido.com uh, because that will give us then uh, the questions and we can choose some of those. Um, what I want to do now is move us on a little bit further. Um, you've heard that the 
whole environment that we were, we were managing and building needed to meet standards, needed to deliver high quality, compassionate care, and also needed to serve a very wide geographic area. Um, and the um, seven network uh, is the area that we've been talking about. And of course, in order to get all of those other acute hospitals aligned and on side uh, and uh, supporting um, required leadership, not just from NOS, but also leadership from uh, Tim Whittlestone, the chief medical uh, officer uh, of the Nightingale. Um, of course, that was his job, um, uh, which was triggered by the Nightingale. Of course, he has, um, like others, other jobs, um, and he is uh, actually at uh, North Bristol NHS Trust. But Tim, do you want to pick up the story from your perspective? Thank, thanks, Steve. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm actually a urologist and um, a urological surgeon by training. I'm still practicing. I specialise in testicular cancer. Um, and over here at Southmead Hospital, I'm the deputy medical director. Um, and it was back in February, early March, we were just getting to grips um, with our understanding of what COVID would bring to the NHS. Um, and we were getting into the various challenges here at South Hospital about infection control and prevention, providing enough oxygen, making sure we've got enough kit. Uh, when I got um, when I got an email, and I think my email was probably the 22nd or 23rd of March, and it was marked classified, uh, Operation Brunel. So who can resist opening a classified uh, email? Uh, and going on to read it. And it was an invitation to be involved in the project. And more or less from that day on, um, I became dedicated to the, the, the what became known as the Bristol Nightingale Project. Um, it was a few days later, I think I met you, Steve, for the first time, and Rich, your head of security over at the Exhibition and Conference Centre, um, and more or less didn't leave. Um, in fact, I've been joking recently that probably you'll have to have me physically removed when it comes to decommissioning at some point. Um, my, my reflections a little bit like Noz are about the speed of transformation. Uh, so my job in the Southmead Hospital is looking at transformation projects and how to make the NHS better for patient care. Uh, and again, like Noz, I tend to measure progress in months and years. But the speed of transformation, um, not just of this hospital, but actually of the creation of an intensive care network across seven large trusts, the delivery of a different operational model um, for an acute field hospital, uh, and all that dealing with a disease of which we knew very little about was simply phenomenal. And I've reflected quite a lot about why, what's the difference? How did we manage to to progress at such pace? Um, I think for me, the biggest factor was emotion. Um, if you recall at that time, we were looking at uh, images nightly on the TV of mass casualties in Italy. We were seeing people being um, uh, removed from the back doors of intensive care units in New York and taken to mass burial sites. And we had modelling um, which demonstrated that we could be facing a similar fate in the United Kingdom. And um, back here at Southmead, we were having conversations in the intensive care community about what would happen when we were full and what would happen when the next 50 year old came into hospital requiring uh, intubation and ventilation and as not being able to provide that care need. And I think there's nothing more devastating for any clinician than simply not being able to offer care. So I think the emotion, the fear, if you like, uh, was one of the major driving factors. Um, I think money was important. Um, we're so used to in public sector living within very tight budgets um, and in this project it's fair to say that there was a, a JFDI culture um, uh, which was very helpful. I think there's a 
definitely a pared down governance arrangements and working in partnership with the armed forces taught me a lot about um, how to how to pare down governance, how to get the job done quickly, um, still with collaboration, still with consent and still with um, uh, a good record and understanding of risk, but nevertheless at speed. Um, as Noza said, having a fantastic regional team, pulling in talented people to work together, um, but also having the public support um, and the media interest, that really kept us going. And it's, it's difficult, you know, sometimes I forget about all of the clap for carers, uh, all about the goodwill uh, that was out there at the time. And that did truly make us all in that team um, want to do the best for our local and regional population. Uh, I think since the, uh, since the project's been complete and open, I've had a bit more time to reflect and I've, um, there's a few slides on there actually, which um, my colleagues might be able to share. Uh, and and what, I've, what I've noticed is, that, of course, the Operation uh, Nightingale uh, reminds us quite a lot about history, but it also shows us something about the future. And this slide um, is about 100 years old, and it's a pandemic field hospital in Boston in Massachusetts uh, during the Spanish flu outbreak. So exactly the same responses happened around that time. We um, Societies built field hospitals, uh, they introduced social distancing masks, it was all there. Uh, next slide. Uh, but exactly at that time as well, it was an opportunity for technology to shine. Um, and uh, many historians we really sort of told us that uh, the telephone uh, had been invented around the time of the Spanish flu. It is a bit of a curiosity. Nobody was terribly interested in, in telephones, but it was the quarantine um, around the time of the Spanish flu, especially in New York and its environments, which, which led to the telephone becoming a useful object. So fascinating to see how even then um, a, a, a world a pandemic could accelerate technological change. And next slide, please. And what we've been doing uh, very carefully at the, at the Nightingale Hospital is trying to explore the possibility of technology. Uh, we've introduced um, quite a lot of AI in the design of the building and in the algorithms behind the operating systems and increasingly have uh, introduced some robotic technology which would allow uh, patients to communicate with relatives and clinicians to communicate with teams. So it's a little bit of an insight into the future um, as we as we start to become a much more technologically savvy national health service. And finally, the next slide, please. So just going back to history, uh, just to, just to reassure people, um, this slide uh, we we did use quite extensively during the modelling phase. You can see where we are. This is the Spanish flu. You can see where we are right now. Um, I don't know whether the second wave is bigger or smaller or flatter than the first wave, but certainly one thing we do know is that all good pandemics come to an end. So please don't um, please don't believe that we'll be here for years and years to come. Uh, Steve, I'll, I'll hand back to yourself. Thank you, Tim. That's uh, that's great. So we're going to spend uh, 10 minutes or so uh, just having a discussion around the table and then we'll open it up for questions. So still lots of time for you to pose your own questions. Uh, and I'm going to start um, with a question uh, really with uh, for Noz. Um, all of us, I think, probably on our risk registers had something called pandemic somewhere on our risk registers. Um, but I'm just interested in your experience, uh, what planning was actually done that helped on the Nightingale um, and the COVID-19 pandemic? Oh, thank you, Steve. That's a, a good question. I think um, there, or oh, I know, there had been theoretical planning around pandemics. And, and clearly, whilst um, we've never experienced a pandemic like this, um, certainly within our lifetimes, what we have done is we have responded to things like SARS, uh, MARS, um, and, you know, we do get 
quite so or we potentially get quite severe flu outbreaks etc and in the younger population whether it's measles so there had been planning and probably some theoretical answers i think what the challenge for us was the sheer size of what we were planning for and you know it, it won't be um a secret to anyone or a surprise it was well broadcasted on the news in trying to get enough equipment um in place in trying to get enough ppe um etc what actually um helped us uh in terms of the nightingale was um actually using the expertise we had in terms of emergency planning and resilience in terms of using, um, we call it the gold command, silver command, um, bronze levels, which provides a very um, effective and robust way of decision making, going right up regionally, nationally, but also locally um, amongst our partners. And that really helped um, get our decision making we needed to get the decisions from all the chief execs um, and our regional colleagues. So that really helped speed the decision making um, up. And um, that's a process that we use daily. We used a higher level twice weekly in the evenings. Um, I think I think that's probably the key um, method that we used in terms of getting the building established. Thanks, Noz. And you and clearly the one of the things was the speed of decision making that was going on uh, was just amazing and not, I suspect, something that many of us in in public sector organisations necessarily will have experienced before that 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 sheer ability to make a decision there and then. Not not at all. And, and what I do need to say, uh, and Tim alluded to it, we were given an incredible amount of freedom freedom to act and if you look at any theory you know if you allow the experts to get on with it they'll get on with it quickly and that was very different in the nightingale experience we really didn't have the bureaucratic chain um, they trusted us as experts when we weren't sure we had somewhere to go but we did have that freedom to act and act daily thanks Thanks, Noz. Tim, can I ask you, I mean, all of this work over a relatively short period of time, um, and you you mentioned right at the beginning um, that, that actually this was about bringing together a network, bringing together uh, chief executives and clinicians, and it was geared around saving lives and that important piece providing hope uh, and also providing resilience to a system. Can you just say a little bit about What's happened since then? Well, how, how does that still work? Yeah, that's a good question. So the so this, the, the seven network, as we've alluded to, is uh, seven partnered hospitals um, in the north of the southwest. Um, so RUH, Swindon, Gloucester, Taunton, Yeovil, um, University of Hospitals, Bristol and North Bristol Trust. And um, what what we what we found is that um, these hospitals um, often worked it in isolation. It's, it's an NHS way. We, every, every hospital wants to do its best. It all it works in isolation. Sometimes it needs some help and it, and it shouts out and gets gets help from its neighbours. But um, during this pandemic first wave, we established a network um, for the benefit of mutual aid. And that meant that none of those hospitals had to suffer in silence, had to become dangerous or over full because um, we facilitated a way of transferring uh, patients who required intensive care between the, between all of those hospitals. Uh, so whilst it's true that the Nightingale Hospital um, has not received a patient, in actual fact, the project uh, did facilitate many, many transfers of patients between those partner hospitals. And that legacy persists. So those hospitals still talk to each other. It's still we we, we, we produce and publish a daily um, 
situation report uh, where each of those hospitals give us their data three times a day. We can sit and monitor what's happening in intensive care units across those hospitals and we can reach out and offer help and assistance. And the quality of care um, is equitable across those seven hospitals, but some hospitals have additional specialist um, uh, features. So, for example, here in Bristol, we're a regional centre for dialysis, and that became a very important consideration during COVID. So we were able to uh, facilitate the transfer of patients who required uh, dialysis for kidney failure. And as I said, that continues and, uh, and, and will be a long lasting legacy. Um, secondly, we were able to um, uh, establish that as a, as, a, as a region, the Southwest uh, had less intensive care beds per head of population than other parts of the United Kingdom. And uh, thankfully, uh, central government um, listened to that and have put in some additional investment, which has meant that we we're able to uh, commission more um, uh, intensive care beds in each of those seven hospitals. Uh, so the network is very strong. Talks to talks uh, talks every day about the situation with COVID, and, and that the, the, the uh, long-lasting legacy will be a permanent increase in the number of intensive care beds for the southwest. Great, thank you. Um, a question, really, uh, and I'm going to probably go to um, let's go to Noz or Tim. Uh, let's do Noz first. There seems to be um, slow progress, little progress um, in terms of a safe vaccine at the moment. This is a question from Bev Cousins. Um, and what does the foreseeable future look like? I guess there's a question out there that we're hearing that some of the Nightingales are on standby in other parts of the country. Um, how long is that going to be for? What happens if those facilities are then decommissioned? Um, and, it, and then there is an urgent need for intensive care beds. So what's the, what do you think the plan, plan is? Thanks, Steve. Um, I think let, let's remember what purpose the Nightingales um, played. In effect, and I think uh, Tim may have coined the phrase first off, we, we always thought of ourselves as an insurance um, policy for our, our wider NHS colleagues. So the way um, the whole of the country has responded is not only do we have very good, very well equipped ITU departments, the hospitals were also able then to increase those facilities to provide extra um, capacity within each of the trusts whether it be in the seven network or throughout the country. But actually, if you go back to those um, pictures that we all saw on the news, what we needed to do, we didn't want to get into a position when the back doors of ITUs were opening and there was nothing. And that really is what prompted um, the Nightingale hospitals. So looking to the future, uh, what we do know nationally is that in the main, we coped with the capacity, we called it ITU plus, that the um, hospitals were able to accommodate. But we still, the Nightingale still stayed as an insurance policy. There's so much about COVID, which I think it's still fair to say that's unknown. And I think if you looked at Tim's graph with the second wave and then the third wave, we, we really don't know what will happen in the future. So every Nightingale hospital, um, when they were put, if you like, in hibernation was a term that was used at one time, they weren't actually put in hibernation. They were put in, in a stand down position. You can't just close one of these hospitals. You have to make sure everything works, um, the water works, the temperatures, everything's clean. So each of these hospitals have been in a stand down, each of the Nightingales. You'll have heard on the news about um, Harrogate, Manchester, Sunderland, I think. They've now been moved into a standby position. You can't actually just open the doors and start caring for patients within a day. You've, you've really got to get um, the staff, all the staff uh, for the Nightingale hospitals are drawn from 
hospitals around us um, and some volunteer groups. So those hospitals have gone into a seven day standby position. If those numbers, particularly those patients requiring intensive care, continue to creep up. The Birmingham, Exeter, Bristol um, facilities and the are still in the stand down, but ready to go into that stand that seven day we will start getting staff in and getting every everything ready should we need it in terms of the longer term i think tim's just alluded to that and i think it's a really positive outcome in that there has been a national recognition that there needs to be investment in more critical care capacity and that's happening um, and the monies have been allocated per region but what we do have to acknowledge, and I am going to go back to Tim's graph and what Tim said, is that every pandemic does have an endpoint. And so um, that's what we've got to look forward to. The Nightingale facilities are there with that as that insurance policy if they are needed. And we've got the expertise. We, we continually train people um, in the background, even while we're in the stand down. But Hopefully we won't need it. And then I think, certainly at UWE, we, you know, we can look how we can use these facilities in the longer term. And, you know, I might have a view. I hope they continue to be used either in some sort of training facility because they're, they're just amazing buildings and amazing healthcare examples of healthcare facilities. Thank you. So, David, that final point about um, the the potential legacy so your your teams put a huge amount of effort into creating uh, that space um what views do you have about what next assuming as tim suggested at some point the pandemic goes well clearly there's a huge amount of investment in, in the building as, as you know steve um it, it works very well uh, i was actually on site at Nightingale yesterday afternoon uh, we've done a little bit of work there to to make it ready uh, for working through the winter because we originally didn't think that was going to be necessary. So that, that works uh, complete now. Um, walking around yesterday, as I did with, with some members of my team and looking at what we've uh, achieved, it, I still thoroughly enjoyed seeing the, the, the quality of the facility. Um, I think it's down to you as to how long you can be tolerant of the NHS being uh, capable of, of using that facility. Obviously, if there's no pressure on uh, them to restore it back to its original uh, glory or whatever you want to do with the building, then uh, it should remain available for as long as possible, I would have thought. Um, they, whilst we did it in, in only 20 days, um, it would uh, obviously was a cheap building to build, but the amount of I don't even know how many man hours of work it was to achieve it. We, we probably could work that out, but um, to, to pull that apart and destroy it and see all the, all that copper pipe work, all those um, thousands of meters of, of data cabling, all the power and, and data systems, all the things that we put together, all carefully controlled with infection control from your team or from the uh, North Bristol NHS's trust team was wonderful. So the longer it can stay as a, as a potential facility, the better. Eventually, clearly, the um, as Tim points out, all good pandemics come to an end eventually. So um, there will be a point where um, it won't be necessary any longer. And um, I'm sure we, there are quite a lot of elements um, that we can remove and retain and can be reused elsewhere. I'm aware of schedules that we have contributed towards, as have other contractors who have built Nightingales across the UK to ensure that um, things that can be repurposed elsewhere in the health service will be repurposed. It's not going to be thousands and thousands of skips going away. We, we will try very much to um, ensure that whatever materials and equipment that can be utilised on other projects in the future will be done so. But um, I think it, it was clearly never designed to be taken apart again, but we know ultimately it's got to go back to what it was before or whatever the uh, university wanted to be in future. Um, but I think if that can remain to it absolutely safe, then then so much the better as far as we're concerned. Thanks. Uh, a couple of questions really, I guess, just to round off this bit and then I'll go on to the questions that are coming in um, from uh, our uh, listeners this evening. 
I guess one of the, the obvious questions is, so what have we learned from this? Uh, and I'm going to go around all of you in terms of uh, what have you learned, uh, in, both in terms of um, what happened, but then the legacy that you'd like to continue, the build beyond where we are now. Um, so I'm going to go to Tim first. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, wh wh what have we learned? Uh, well, we've learned not to take things for granted. Um, nature has a funny way of reminding us who's in charge uh, when it creates uh, diseases with uh, bizarre physiology. Uh, we've learned about the spirit of, um, of, of uh, the, the spirit of human nature, about how people can pull together to solve problems, and it's a it's a really um, looking globally at a global picture, it's a real, you know, spirit born of the United Kingdom, I would say. That's very, very special and gives us the ability to do projects like this. I think in terms of the legacy, I think it might be another hundred years before we see a pandemic um, of, on this scale again. And of course, during that hundred years, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to forget all about the 2020-2021s. So, We've got to capture the learning, uh, Steve. We've got to capture as much um, of what we did, of what went well. We've got to be very honest about what didn't go well, uh, because you know, by no means was this, you know, a perfect project with the hundred percent hit rate. Uh, there were mistakes. We've got to learn by the mistakes and be honest with them uh, about them, so that we can capture that, so we are prepared for, uh, you know, the next national emergency. Thank you. And Noz? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, despite being as busy as we were, um, certainly as the senior leadership team, we recognised uh, the need to really capture what, what we've learned as we went through it. And we wanted to capture that from all levels, um, through the work streams um, and outside of the Nightingale. So we have got a number of lessons learnt, both good and not so good, um, predominantly good. I think what I take from this is one, um, one of the things, you know, if you were to do something differently, it took a while, uh, some colleagues said, to get the leadership team together. What this has shown us is there's um, a wealth of expertise if you're prepared to look wider and go across a region. And um, what would be useful is that, I don't know, whether there's a log of that level of expertise. Um, I'm, not, I'm not presuming we'll have to build field hospitals um, again, but actually the strength of how we came together with all that um, expertise and from a variety of organisations was that it really contributed to the um, out-of-box thinking, to um, coming up with um, novel solutions, but equally to getting problems um, solved. I would hope that um, regionally they look at that and look at how they can bring people together, whether they do it in exercises. We do exercise for major incidents, but that's slightly different. The other thing we learnt, and again, Tim's alluded to it, and I know um, I've had direct experience of it, but the army, because they trained for it the whole time, I'm RAF um, reservist, we, we have a very set way of approaching um, deployment and we never know where we're going. And half the time we don't know what we're going to get when we go there. But actually we call them modules. We, have, um, we know that we've got um, a set of kit that we'll take out and we know what's in that kit and we know how to enhance it. And again, that's what the army taught us. They, they taught us how if we break all our kit down into a modular format, um, we can track it, we can monitor it. So any of that learning, and I know we have to do that, that we can take from the military, albeit the NHS is a slightly different context. Let's look at how we can use that to develop um, our leadership teams, you know, through the wards, through the divisions, the sub-organisations um, for the future. I mean, there'll be a million other areas of um, learning, Steve, but they're the key things that stuck out for me. Great, thank you. There's a, I'm going to go to the questions now and see if we can rattle through some of the questions because it's clearly um, uh, 
triggered all sorts of interesting um, areas to explore. One of them, Muir MacDonald, who's the chair of the IOD in the Southwest, um, has picked up on one of the things that you've said, which was around the, the pared down uh, governance piece. Uh, and in particular, how, how are you now being able to move that into routine day-to-day uh, governance in, in your jobs? Has, has any of that stuck or has the NHS forgotten it very quickly? Tim, let's go to you, you're smiling. <laughs> Uh, yes, I think. Well, I could talk. I could talk for hours about this. So it's, it is. Um, I've now become passionate about pairing now and governance, and now I'm back in 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 my host trust or my home trust, I should say, in North Bristol. I'm I'm making inroads. Uh, I think the NHS will have learned a lot. Uh, and one practical thing I can report is that we have um, we we are establishing an NHS and MOD. Uh, leadership academy and it's not just about making leaders it's actually about understanding how each other's governance processes work um, the fascinating thing I went into this not knowing anything about the military and I thought that um, you know in the army people were given orders and they said you know fire here and shoot this in actual fact it's not like that at all um, they managed to balance sort of collaborative governance structure uh, with a very pared down direct governance structure. It's a little bit of magic that they pull off. They give people, people on the ground, they give them the opportunity to solve a problem. They don't tell them the solution. They say, here's the problem. We trust you to solve it. Check it with us when you come up with the answer. And if it looks okay, then go with it. And that's really what this NHS MOD um, Leadership Academy is trying to achieve. So hopefully through that, at least in Bristol and hopefully in the southwest uh, we'll have something uh, that pays dividends right david is that is that, that how your world works already sorry is that, i'll say that again steve sorry isn't that how the sort of your construction world sort of works already in terms of uh, much of the learning that we captured in the nhs certainly on site in those 20 odd days that's definitely yeah, what so we're it's interesting the uh, the question of, of what we learned on the legacy piece um uh, whereas in march april the pressure was all on that to hospitals it's moving as we go into october november into uh covid testing labs there's a huge program which the nhs are about to roll out we've all signed ndas i can't talk about them in, in in detail but there's a there's a huge amount of work going on now behind the scenes in terms of um, how we can create sufficient COVID testing facilities in the UK uh, to, to, to cope with the demand. Um, I was interviewed for one of those projects this afternoon um, and I was asked in that interview what, what lessons we've learned from the Nightingale experience. Um, I think, yes, we, 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 <laughs> we're quite an efficient industry as it is. We work on very low margins and we, we do quite well, but the the culture that we grew up with in uh, the, on the Nightingale Hospital and we've seen elsewhere on the Nightingales we've delivered in Swansea and elsewhere. It's all about what what can you achieve in the time using the um, available parts. It's to do to do what we did in 20 days uh, required us to only work with things we could get hold of, people we could get hold of and equipment that was available. The same is true to some extent in relation to the next phase of this, the COVID testing labs. There's um, an expectation on us as an industry to, to perform very well and deliver a huge amount of technically complex buildings, category two labs across the UK. Um, but the way, uh, as was said earlier on, the way in which um, NOS is used to dealing with procuring buildings and, and, and running the NHS, we are now having to work with what we've got and make sure that we can plan and organise uh, projects based on not what we'd like to do, but what we have to do, because there's only a finite number of elements, be it generators or air, air handling units or pumps or, or pieces of equipment that, that we can rely on. So, yes, it's an efficient industry that plans well, but I think post the Nightingale era and all lessons we've learned from doing the Nightingales mean that we're in far better shape to respond to a, a huge demand now for other things built in equally quick time. Great, thank you. And but just for um, my organisation, uh, which loves bureaucracy, I have to say, um, I, I'm trying to push um, governance with purpose, perspective and passion. 
uh, and within that to get rid of the bits of paper that fly around for no particular reason um, but clog stuff up. So uh, together we might make a little tiny bit of progress um, as that goes forward. Can I uh, pick up a, a question from Geoffrey Bolland, um, who's in Australia at the moment, as I said earlier. What happens to the kit post COVID-19? Um, and can it be reassembled quickly for subsequent use in the UK or for instance, in a case uh, somewhere else in the world? So can we move stuff around? And I know that the network of Nightingales and the way in which NHS um, have uh, operated to date would suggest that that is possible. Um, Noz or Tim? Oh, I, I'm Noz, happy to. Please. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to start, um, Steve. Um, so uh, it, you brought a smile to my face. We uh, we called this room in the Nightingale um, Tim's war chest. Uh, where we, uh, using the army's expertise, we had all the IV pumps, the um, haemofiltration, the ventilators all lined up. Um, what happens to all the kit? That that will probably be a central um, decision, I suspect, in terms of um, will they have a central store or a regional store? A lot of the kit, because we're increasing intensive care capacity, and it is predominantly intensive care kit that we had, can be used um, in trusts, whether it be to support their extra beds and or in replacement. We like to think that hospitals have all brand new shiny equipment the whole time. They don't. They have to have a replacement scheme. So one would expect, so I'm thinking about the beds, for example, um, that they could be used to support um, hospitals and therefore value for money when their own kit is coming to the end of its um, lifespan. I'll have to hand over to Tim because I don't know if there is um, an actual programme in place um, at the moment, but that's, that, that's certainly plausible. Tim? Uh, no, you're absolutely right, uh, Noz. I mean, there, there will be a programme in place. It's uh, all the kits that everything's owned by, by by the NHS, ultimately by you know by uh, taxpayers, and it will be used accord, uh, you know, distributed wisely. One thing I point out is that you know this was an opportunity, as I've alluded to, to have a very technologically advanced hospital. Um, we actually um, designed and built a, a paperless hospital. There's you know there's no paper records. Everything done um, by uh, soaking up um, clinical information into the cloud um, where it's curated and observed by clinicians and those systems obviously very expensive to procure and so one of the obvious lasting legacies will be that um, for, our, for the region uh, we have uh, made a massive technological leap in our ability uh, to monitor and curate clinical information for our intensive care patients, uh, so that's a that's a clear uh, a clear leap forward by I would estimate about seven years in terms of in terms of our uh, technological ability uh, to monitor intensive care patients. That, given the timeframes that all of that was happening in, is quite remarkable that there was there was the foresight to start to say we're going to do this and we're going to do it differently. There were, my understanding was that there were obviously learnings that came out from the other Nightingale hospitals. There were some templates in terms of, of what you needed um, and a sort of a standard, a standard NHS uh, template. But David, when you arrived on site, was any of that available to you? Or did it come after, after the event a bit? The, the one organisation I should have mentioned at the start probably was was our architects BDP. Now BDP, uh, we work with uh, on lots of healthcare schemes. We're currently working with them at uh, Musgrove Park on a very large project there. Um, BDP were the architects of um, the London uh, Nightingale, so um, we managed to uh, identify that they had some level of embedded knowledge um, on the bed sizing, bed arrangements um, and, and spacing of the, the, the layout of the hospital. Um, as you'll recall, um, when's your birthday, Steve? What day? It was, uh, yeah, it was the 27th of March. 27th, 27th of March. March. 
Yeah. Well, I, I can, uh, the only reason for people to think that's a weird question for me to ask, but um, um, on the 27th of March, you and I were walking around the campus beyond the, the main conference centre, looking at other buildings that we might want to utilise. Um, you shared with me as we walked back from your sports centre, this is the best birthday you've ever had, which is why I, I <laughs> recall the, the, the day. Um, but we were then using the, the knowledge we gained from um, BDP on, on the, what number of beds we could probably fit into the conference centre. We were looking at other buildings on the site and beyond with you, which was you know, a, a, a surreal experience because we were trying very hard to think of what can we do, and, and let's, but, but we chose to prioritise the conference centre. There was always a, a next phase, which thankfully, when we were part way through day 10, we realised that probably there wouldn't be a need for that extra phase. But so, but the embedded knowledge we, we gained from BDP, um, the photographs and images um, we, we, we'd seen, Hawley and partners were not our M&E con consultants, but they were the M&E consultants on uh, the London one as well. So they were able to share lots of data which they procured in terms of distributing oxygen and uh, medical gases. So there was a, a level of, of sharing of information, but. It's true to say that everyone at that stage was completely on their back foot. We were really trying very hard to deliver in, in ridiculously short timescales. So um, we were all grabbing hold of bits of information and trying to make sure we utilised it to best effect. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a question from Keith Hicks, um, and it, it's about um, in the press, there's all sorts of uh, statements around healthcare skill shortages. Um, and the need for, especially in nursing, for another 50,000 nurses by 2025. So tremendous um, expansion. And uh, the question is really, how did we, how did we go about thinking for the workforce of uh, a potential nightingale? Now, the professional staff, so those staff who were um, coming in from the network, were sort of going to come with their patients almost. But there was another part of the workforce that really needed to be geared up very, very quickly. So some thoughts on that, Noz. I'll come to you first. Yes, um, I think uh, because we were driven by what we had to deliver and what there was around, it really did, and Tim's used the, the word, it really did push um, transformational thinking. And, and if I can... If I can, if you don't mind, Steve, I do want to blow the trumpet of the team I led. They they didn't just accept the template of other um, nightingales. They did want to go one step further. So um, Tim talking about the paperless um, system we had, not the same in um, every nightingale. And, you know, they would come with these ideas. Other nightingales weren't going to allow... Um, relatives in. Uh, we had a family liaison officer and a chief nurse who said, no, we must. So we found ways um, of uh, doing that. Um, now that I've done that, I've forgotten the question, Steve. I'm really sorry. So, it was about <laughs> so the, quest the question was about the, the, the oh, workforce well, that was really needed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a painless yeah. environment, lots of data and information. Yeah. Some staff, but actually... So Hearing that for 300 is massive. Absolutely. So what, what we learned through the pandemic, and sadly, there were a lot of staff furloughed. If you think about um, EasyJet, uh, even vets, um, what we realised was that we couldn't provide it all. So we had to use a very different model uh, in intensive care. What some of uh, the audience may not realise is in using that model, that's why the Nightingale is designed as it is, very open plan so that you can observe um, the patient. So we actually worked using new roles. Um, one of them was the bed care, bedside care worker. It was one person who would always be with that patient, but not necessarily um, a healthcare, or from a healthcare background. Clearly, with the support of your, your lecturers and staff, Steve, we trained everyone up very quickly. In terms of other staff groups, we learned a lot from um, our army colleagues again. Um, in effect, they took on all the fit testing, so making sure the PPE um, was adequate and fit for purpose and fitted each individual. 
But in doing that, they wrote um, an SOP for us, a standard operating procedure. And actually that work was handed over to the contracted company, which I think Serco, so that they could train their um, staff to deliver the same standard um, of care. But what I would say is, and, and we have heard about the national shortage of different professional groups, predominantly nurses, um, I have seen it reported and we are seeing evidence that actually in a time of crisis, um, you'd think that a lot of people would be scared of coming into the profession, but actually having had that amazing UK response, what we are finding is that we've got more applications to train to become nurses, physios, um, doctors, Tim can validate that or not. I think the trick for us now is how do we develop these individuals so that they've got the flexibility of skills, because what we need to do is to be able to step up to a different level of critical care when and as needed. Whereas traditionally, we, we've really become so specialised that you're either a medical nurse, a surgical nurse, an ITU nurse, and that level of flexibility we've lost. So whatever education programme we give them, we need to be able to give them a stage programme so that they can come into practice um, at, a, at an earlier time and, uh, if you like, learn more on the job. But we build their skills and their academic um, the academic content to back that up as they go along. So we are seeing more people applying for healthcare jobs. We do need more, um, but I think we do need to think more flexibly how we use them. Great. And just some of the learning that uh, the university took from this. We um, put together a training program, which was a two day program that took people from EasyJet or took people from veterinary practice or dental nurses uh, and immersed them uh, down at Glenside for a two-day uh, really intensive program and rotated them through. Uh, it was the first um, of its kind and then was shared across the rest of the country in terms of the IP and the learning that came from it. We followed, interestingly, we followed the same approach that was going on in the build of the Nightingale and your teams in terms of storyboarding and making sure that the teams actually worked through how everything was going to work. Uh, and we put uh, uh, over a very short period of time that program in place um, and then ran 420 uh, people through it who were then confident about the environment that they were going to be working in. Um, uh, and those people um, really were amazing because they were volunteering uh, knowing that they would be going into environments that would be quite challenging. Uh, and as you say, Noz, those would be the people at the bedside all the time, uh, supporting the staff, um, the nursing and uh, medical staff, uh, but they would actually be there next to the patients if, if need be. And of course, uh, that resource, uh, if, if we ever need to mobilise it again, is there ready uh, and of course would need um, a little bit of work to just to refresh, but I think they got an awful lot from that experience. Uh, a great team effort working with colleagues in the NHS, the critical care uh, physicians and anaesthetists were also part of the team that were there. Um, and all of this was going on during lockdown. So uh, huge, huge um, effort of, of, um, of staff at the university working with NHS staff. Um, we're coming into the final 10 minutes, though, um, so I'm just going to go through a few more questions. Um, and, it, and really, they're similar in terms of themes that have been building up as we've been going. Um, one of them, um, how, given the speed and the intensity um, of the build, but also the, the ability to bring the NHS together, to build the network, to get the buy-in from the chief executives, to deal with, you don't have to comment on this one, but to deal with some of the frustrations of uh, local versus uh, regional versus national decision-making. Uh, and if number 10 ever got involved in anything, then the decision-making really went weird. Um, but in all of that, in all of that, how did you manage as a team uh, and 
support your colleagues to to manage um, to be resilient to deal with the mental health sheer drain uh, that was there so I'm going to go to I'll go to each of you because I think it was different for different people and we got a little bit of it on the film but I'm going to go to Noz then Tim uh, and then David okay so uh, resilience um so uh I think, Steve, you pointed out to us that you learned that the army definitely does march on its stomach. And uh, we were working very long hours. And one of the most important things was to ensure that we were hydrated, we did have food, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing, though, is that as a team, we had fun. Um, and uh, I think our Kia colleagues will remember this. I set someone the task. We called it Operation Easter Bunny because we were working very long days every day over the week, Easter weekend, and it seemed quite sad if we couldn't get an Easter egg. Uh, I thought we might just get a few for those of us in the planning, but um, we ended up not paying for one, and we had hundreds of the eggs. But what we did then, we recognised that our Kia colleagues were working flat out and we made sure we brought them some uh, Easter eggs from Operation Easter Bunny. That's just one example of the types of thing that we used to do to just give ourselves time to remember there was a real world going on um, outside that. However, the, the final thing I'd say is what was um, most impressive about this is that we got to know each other very quickly. And part of the resilience um, and maintaining your own mental health is just being aware of how colleagues are either struggling with whatever they were trying to deliver there in their portfolio. No one wanted to fail and be there to listen, give ideas and also to tell people they needed to um, go home. Um, the, there was a lot put in for all the staff, though. We did employ um, um, someone, Melitza, to look at how we would support staff welfare and staff mental health. And uh, we had a whole programme of work that supported that with um, time out zones, cool down zones, comfortable areas, um, access to food, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, we work with um, psychologists and mental health partners to look at um, programs that could be put in place rapidly to support any staff um, who needed it after, you know, if they were to work in such difficult circumstances. Thank you, Noz. And Tim? Yeah, I think as so. well, in terms of personal resilience, it, it, again, fantastic team, common sense of purpose, a single mission. Um, I mean, most of us in our day jobs are dealing with, you know, 20, 30 open projects we're trying to deliver, but this is a single mission that's always helpful. But I think most of all, um, it was about the, um, the, the, again, the knowledge of our colleagues in other parts of uh, the United Kingdom who were dealing with some horrendous um, scenes, um, very difficult disease, uh, very compromised patients, uh, often with a poor outcome. Um, and just keeping that in mind, really, you know, my, my job as as the sort of chief doctor there really is just to, is just to, to keep reminding everybody that this was about patients and saving lives and 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 trying to avoid us having to make difficult decisions uh, in Bristol and in the region. So uh, that single mission um, was very important. Thank you, and David. Um, I think the, the, the Nightingale was a bit like a drug. So this, this huge injection of adrenaline um, kicked in when, when we got involved and it kept going for 20 days. The superb amount of pride that everyone felt for the project, um, not just the contractors, the the team we worked with, Trisha Down, the, the whole of the, the health team uh, from the North Bristol team. The, there was a huge sense of pride in, in achieving something very special together and nobody really flagged at any point in that process. Um, I, I couldn't believe the fact that I, I pulled my team together. We were, as you, as you correctly point out, we were in lockdown at the time, so some of our contracts weren't going as fast as they ordinarily would. So we brought staff in from all sorts of places, from Devon, from South Wales, but mostly the Bristol area. 
every one of them worked the same shift, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, every single one of them at the end of the project thanked me for choosing them on this team. So to be thanked by people for making them work um, 12 <laughs> hours a day, seven days a week was remarkable, but they all felt it was an honour and a privilege to be involved, as did I. Thank you, David. And from the university's um, position as well, we very similar in terms of staff who were volunteering um, and also dealing with their own personal circumstances. So staff who had lost loved ones to COVID and yet still wanted to come in uh, and deliver um, the programme of work and the teaching. And we saw the same in the volunteers, that many of the volunteers had seen grandparents and parents um, die as a result of COVID-19, uh, and yet they still wanted to come forward. Now, some of those we had to support, and uh, as they were going through the two days uh, and were recognising and realising what it would mean to work in that environment, uh, we worked with them and they decided that, it, that, it, that they weren't ready. And we supported them uh, and picked them up and made sure that they were supported uh, as part of um, uh, the care that we needed to give those people uh, who were really walking into the unknown. Uh, and I think that care, that compassion, uh, but also the pride in doing something together um, did move through, I think, all elements of, of this project. Of course, the hope is that we never have to use it. And that still remains the ambition. Um, but as we're seeing around the rest of the country, uh, we, it does look as though we're heading into quite some tricky waters. And so uh, we have to be ready, and I can uh, confidently can confirm we are ready if we need to. Um, but more importantly, the network, the seven network, um, has learned to work effectively together. The acute services working uh, to share uh, and to ensure that patients are always at the front of everyone's thinking uh, to deliver the best quality care we possibly can. Um, so the Nightingale is here, it's there as, as the insurance uh, if it's needed, and it will be there for as long as it's needed. Um, whilst it does uh, currently look to be completed uh, in terms of its use by the end of March. If that is not the case, then the university will continue to support um, it for as long as it's needed uh, to serve the community. So that insurance case, I think, is solid and, and uh, uh, I, I think is important to be there. So I'm very conscious that we are rapidly approaching uh, eight o'clock, the time at which we um, would normally uh, log off and invite you to some light refreshments. And I can't do that in the virtual world, but I can encourage you to, to perhaps find some of your own light refreshments. And the good news oh. is uh, that you're not going to have to drive home afterwards. So that's, uh, that's a positive. Um, many of the people on the, who are observing and um, uh, uh, watching us are just wanting to express a huge thanks to the panel for such an insightful discussion um, and, uh, and demonstrate such collaboration across sectors. Um, the learning, the legacy, the hope, the inspiration uh, and the pride that clearly comes through uh, from all of you uh, this evening. So on behalf of our audience, uh, but also in, on behalf of the university uh, and the communities that we all serve, thank you. Thank you for being there when we needed you. Uh, and thank you for still being there as we navigate the next few months, uh, which are going to be difficult for all of us. Um, so thank you all uh, out there who are watching in. Um, your support is essential as ever. Um, the university uh, reaches out to you uh, and you are engaging with us and that's hugely important. So I hope that you've enjoyed this evening. Um, join me in, a, in, in your own way. A round of applause for the people who've um, uh, taken part this evening. Uh, please stay safe, follow the rules, and make sure that you're looking after your own personal safety and those around you. So social distancing, um, washing your hands, making sure that you're wearing a face covering when need be, but also monitoring your own health. And if you are showing any of the symptoms that could potentially be 
COVID-19, make sure that you are tested. Um, and remember that those symptoms include a temperature uh, and a loss of taste, as well as uh, smell and that uh, cough that we all started to get to learn about very early on. Uh, stay safe, look after each other, above all, be kind to each other uh, and care about uh, each other as you go forward. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you to my panel. You've been fantastic. And thank you for helping us to experiment a bit with this venture into the virtual world for our distinguished addresses. And I can think of nothing better than actually doing it for the NHS Nightingale, which was um, inspirational, innovative, creative, um, and I hope taught us a huge amount. So thank you all very, very much for listening. Thank you.